wisdom as inner power. Very interestingly, Anthony Ian La Reno on March 24, 2010 actually posted this. Knowledge is not power. Wisdom is power. So what is wisdom and how can it be learned or taught? Well, we, we look at the indigenous people, especially the Korean people in the hot district of Chiang Mai, Northern Thailand. If we do learn from these indigenous communities, ground up, in other words, from below, especially from the multi-varsity campus of life, where they live life that is sustainable with dignity, in harmony with the ecosystem and biodiversity, there's much to learn about ancestral wisdom from them. See, they were caught in a bind between the moneylenders bent on grabbing the land and the shortage of rice since 1975 due to poverty. In such a food crisis, the village leaders turned to the ancestral wisdom which exhort the listeners. If we have enough rice to eat, then everything else will follow of its own accord. Work the right amount, eat the right amount of food. Work with your hand, eat with your mouth. Don't be greedy, don't be avarice. Those who have more, eat less and the rest must be shared. When we have, we all eat together. When we do not have, we all starve together. Then the leaders organize themselves into rice merit network in which every household brings the rice gathering their shares after each harvest of the paddy grain. Korean ancestral wisdom guide each household of the Korean communities to give thanks to the creator, known as Tachitato, before planting and after harvesting. Now, they are self-sufficient and they can share their grains with the migrants from Myanmar who spill over at the Thai-Myanmar border as a result of the civil war. Now, what is wisdom? Perhaps we can, we can look to Elizabeth Schuster Fiorenza from the Harvard Divinity School uh, before. Uh, she is the leading biblical, a uh, women biblical scholar. Now, for her, wisdom is derived from the Latin form sapientia, and which is derived from the verb, the verb sapere, meaning to taste and to savor something. Therefore, wisdom is the power of discernment, deeper understanding, and creativity. It is the ability to move and to dance, to make the connections, to savor life and to learn from experience. Wisdom is intelligent, shaped by experience. This is key. Huh? And sharpened by critical analysis. It is the ability to make sound choices and incisive decisions. At the cognitive level, Fiorenza believes wisdom is a capability which refers to the quality of life and of people, and at the same time, a figuration of, divine, of the divine, a female personification of wisdom, to be more precise. First, wisdom as capability. Fiorenza actually believes that wisdom is found in the imagination and writing of all known religions as a capability and more importantly, wisdom is practical knowledge gained through experience and daily living as well as through the study of creation and human nature. 
and hence wisdom is transcultural, international, interreligious. Indeed, wisdom is really um, the the gift, it's a divine gift to all humankind. As a capability, wisdom is a state of the human mind and spirit characterized by deep understanding and profound insights. It is elaborated as a quality possessed by the sages, but also treasure as folk wisdom and wit. Now the same guy, Ian Narino, who said knowledge is not power, wisdom is power. He believes wisdom consists of knowledge, experience, and understanding, and above all, Wisdom is insight with the ability to diagnose and size up a situation where much is unknown, discerning what is wrong, what is missing, and what might improve it. It is also intuition that enables one to sense deep down what feels right when no knowledge or experience is available. Back to Fiorenza. On her, on explaining you know, the second aspect of wisdom as personification. Fiorenza explained wisdom as a spiraling presence that is global, embracing all creation, much akin to a spiraling circle dance of wisdom, a very feminine image, deriving a spirit or spiritual intellectual movement in the open space of wisdom who inspire justice-seeking earth sojourners to critically analyze, debate, and reimagine sacred texts and their commentaries as wisdom texts. So the wisdom becomes life-nurturing for everyone and everything in our common home, building, as it were, a wisdom-inspired civilization of future to come. Now, how can wisdom be learned? Wisdom as a capacity can suddenly be learned and taught in the multi rusty campus of life experience in group interaction with the living wisdom figures like the women and men, elders, healers, mystics, sages, and shamans. The setting is more informal with storytelling as a method, sharing stories of common concerns that affect the community such as the coming together for the seasonal rituals to make the beginning of the season to prepare the slopes for intercropping of hill rice and corns, irrigating the paddy fields for planting the young seedlings, shorter to water during the long drought. Other concerns include welcoming of the village guests, preparing praying over the sick, preparation for a wedding, for a wake, a burial, celebration, the birth of a grandchild. The ancestral folklores and myths are narrated so as to draw lessons from the time immemorial wisdom of the ancestors and elders to guide the community to face such common concerns and issues. In other words, Ritual celebration and festivities are the valuable occasion for learning the ancestral wisdom from the, ev from the everyday life of the people. And this is a really a wisdom as a personification through the sacred dance. And then you see on the right, you know, there's the Hoye. Hoye is actually a worship place for the Lahu people. Uh, they are actually in northern Thailand and also in the southern China, in Yunnan province. See, wisdom as a part of personification can suddenly be personally experienced as I did in the sacred ritual and festive celebrations of the ethnic communities. And this is suddenly true when the Lahu communities gather in the Hoye for sacred communal worship to, 
to really listen to Kusha. So in the communion chanting that will reach a crescendo and then there's this beating of the gong and listening to the booming sound of the gong the chief Tobo will await the descent of the divine creator in the midst of the worshipping community and as the chief Tobo he listens and he gets the message of Kusha of the creator God and he communicates Kusha wisdoms to the messages to the people and very interestingly once the people hear this message you know they all give their assent to the divine counsel and wisdom by all arising together at the sound of the flute which blurts out and they all dance in unison as it were the whole community in their bodies are worshipping with thanksgiving for such divine wisdom so it's really a wisdom personified and embodied and danced yeah, danced and the dance spiraled you know, in two or three circles in joyful celebration it's a wonderful experience you know. and then of course you know in the in Canada itself um, the Mikwa people are guided you know, by this wisdom called the two I see you know, because they, they, they face the current crisis you know, uh, in terms of the government taking their land uh, without prior and uh, informed consent and so they say it is important no, to, to, to resort to this ancestral wisdom called two eyes seeing seeing from one eye with the strengths of indigenous knowledges and way of knowing and from the other with the strengths of western knowledge and ways of knowing and then to use both eyes together for the benefit of all all meaning the common good of everyone especially those who are dispossessed you know? and this is very very important you know? the indigenous wisdom has guided the indigenous people you know, to be outstanding caretakers of the natural environment and they are typically on the front line of land defense issues and lands managed by indigenous communities tend to be healthier than other areas so if you look at the Andean people the Indios the world is divided into three parts the human and domesticated the wild meaning species ecosystems and water then you have got the third domain the sacred and ancestral you know? this is where uh, where you know the, 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 the human world interacts uh, with the sacred and the ancestral to learn of that wisdom to be taught by the ancestral spirit uh, and the creator spirit so rather than focusing on the economic development their goal is holistic well-being not just the, the, the holistic well-being of the human but the entire cosmos the entire earth in that holistic interbeing uh, wholeness which is well achieved through balance between these three worlds and above all the Indian people have much to teach us because we are looking at indigenous management you know, which is associated with high vertebrate biodiversity and thus this is mutually beneficial collaboration between indigenous people and of course non-indigenous to who, who do appear capable of helping countries such as Canada, Australia and Brazil to meet their 
Convention on Biodiversity Targets. You know? So I think this collaborative partnership between indigenous and non-indigenous land managers could also help redress the historic wrongs by developing new synergetic state relationships capable of advancing con conservation, sustainable resource use, and human well-being in harmony with the entire home, that is the oikos, our common home to earth. This is wisdom that is taught, that is learned from one generation to the next, and indeed as a capability, as a personification in the multiversity campuses of life and life experiences as we reflect, analyze, indeed to the guidance of the ancestral spirits, we will indeed learn, imbibe, and embody, and practice wisdom, and become then an inner power for sustainable civilization and future.